and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 7, Episode 16, The Doll. Hello everyone. I hope everyone out there is doing just excellent. I'm doing pretty well. It's been uh, kind of busy and um, a crazy week. My kids had a long weekend because of Martin Luther King Jr. Day on Monday, and then they also got a day off on Tuesday because of the frigid temperatures here. Um, We had quite the cold snap, so because of just, um, you know, being too cold, they got the day off, (laughs) which immediately triggered my husband and I into the, in my day, that never happened. You just, it's part of getting old. You have to sound old and tell old people stories that you hated when you were younger and were like, I don't care. God, that was so long ago, which it was, but (laughs) you got to say it. I mean, it's just a rite of passage. You have to become one of those old farts who just says, well, you know, I never got snow days. I never cold weather. Come on. And your voice does that too, just automatically. It's it's insane. Um, well, I wanted to start out by, well, I'm not proud of it. And once again, Greg of Greg Sack Lunch alerted me to yet another Seinfeld death that occurred. Peter Crombie, died. He played Crazy Joe Devola. He passed away on January 10th at the age of 71. So it sounded like it was pretty sudden. He had a, an intestinal illness, according to the statement by his ex-wife, who um, said some really sweet things about him, along with other colleagues and friends of his. Um, you know, sounded like he was a really great guy and just such a gifted actor. I mean, I think I didn't love the character, but he certainly brought Crazy Joe Devola to life. One of the most memorable characters, that's for sure. So um, I guess the curse strikes again. At least that's what Greg thinks. Um, I still stand by the fact that this has nothing to do with me, but uh, there have been quite a few deaths since I started this podcast. However, you know, it must be recognized that this show is, well, I mean, it's around 30 years old. So if people were on that show at that time, there's a good chance they're 30 years older now. So, um, I mean, I know I am. And as you get older, not only do you tell stories about in your day, but you also die sometimes, you know, it really makes you think, but... um, I think these are just big coincidences. But anyway, we definitely uh, send our condolences to all of the people who loved Peter Crombie, his family, friends, uh, definitely someone who made his mark on Seinfeld, Crazy Joe Devola. Any fan knows knows that (laughs) character pretty well, and he really did a great job on the show. My Seinfeld IRL moments. Now, I have one that I'm going to mention later in the episode because it relates to a certain aspect of this episode. But just this morning, there was another Seinfeld IRL. I really felt... Now, this is an in-real-life moment that didn't happen on Seinfeld, but I could easily see maybe Elaine kind of having this storyline. Basically, um, I'll give you one guess where I was this morning. That's right. It was the gym. Um, so I was leaving the gym and it's post-workout. My my mouth is a little bit dry because of the huffing and the puffing I was doing while I was working out. And so I was licking the side of my mouth and then I kind of locked eyes with this guy walking by me and I accidentally flirted with him, I guess, because he sort of, he kind of did like a, we we locked eyes, but then he kind of really focused in and like smirked a little bit. And I was like, oh God, I was licking my like the, my mouth when I was looking at him. (laughs) I was not flirting. It was totally accidental flirting. So I just thought that would have been a really fun 
storyline. I guess the closest we come to that is when George is winking. There was no accidental flirting there. Well, I think, well, I think Elaine thought he might have been because Elaine got irritated by that. <laughs> it's really obnoxious. Maybe she thought George was flirting with her. But anyway, I, I thought that would have been a really funny plot line for Elaine. Maybe she accidentally flirts with a guy and then hilarity ensues, however it does. But yeah, I was thinking, I was like, yeah, I'm like licking that, like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't like porno licking. It was just kind of like, you know, like, you can't see me. This is an audio medium. But I was just kind of gently licking the side of my mouth, the corner of my mouth, and looked up and locked eyes with a random guy. <laughs> and now I think I have something to confess to my husband, unfortunately. Okay, let's get into this episode. The synopsis for the doll is as follows. One of Susan's dolls looks like George's mother, making him unable to perform in bed. Frank Costanza puts a pool table in George's old bedroom. Jerry runs out of stand-up material. <laughs> That's just one sentence. A Costanza, whom Elaine saw in Tuscany, looks like Frank and might be his long-lost cousin, Carlo. Kramer and Jerry adopt the maestro's habit of not sitting down in trousers to keep the crease in the pants. Elaine pursues an autograph from one of the three tenors. Jerry is forced to transport a package given to him by Susan's old college roommate. This episode was written by Max Pross and Tom Gamble. And this synopsis was written by a terrible, terrible writer. <laughs> okay, so we start out in a comedy club in Memphis. We see Jerry come off stage and he runs into Sally Weaver, Susan's old college roommate. She <laughs> she gives him a big hug or uh, I guess tries to Kesha him. And he's all like, hey, hey, and then realizes who she is. She tells him she loved the show and thanks him for the tickets. You are so funny. No, I really mean it. You're so funny. And he's like, I believe you. <laughs> She tells him that she's going to take him out to dinner, but he says, oh, sorry, I have to go straight to the airport. Oh, that's too bad. Susan thought we'd really get along, probably because we're both wacko. She hands over a huge wrapped gift box. It's George and Susan's wedding present from her, and she tells Jerry to take it with him and to be careful with Jerry. Be very careful. Uh, the actress who plays Sally Weaver is Kathy Griffin. Now, you may know Kathy from a number of TV shows, her stand-up, or more recently being harassed for years by the Trump administration for a photo. Okay, so <laughs> Kathy Griffin is obviously very polarizing. I do consider myself a fan. I watched her reality show in the early 2000s called My Life on the D-List. I found her to be... First of all, incredibly funny. I mean, such a quick wit. I gravitate towards those types of people who can just come up with such funny material right on the spot. And that's what she does. I mean, she is incredibly funny. I found her really inspiring, too. She, let's face, I mean, the name of her reality show was My Life on the D-List. And it was really essentially a story about kind of an outsider, you know, not someone who's the typical Hollywood type where they're beautiful and, and uh, you know, accepted and very, I don't know, for lack of a better term, just a pretty person who gets accepted into that whole, you know, gang of people. Now, I know that her whole shtick is to kind of make fun of celebrities. So you make your bed, you got to lie in it. But um, anyway, I, I even went to one of her live stand-up shows when she came to Detroit. I find her, I find her really entertaining. Um, and she's able to make fun of herself, which I think is such a valuable uh, asset to have in your personality. <laughs> so love her or hate her, she is pitch perfect as Sally Weaver. Yes, she's loud and annoying, but that's what and who <laughs> Sally Weaver is. And I'm really not sure anyone could have done it better with the with the correct sitcom tone that she has. Like she has that IQ to know how to apply such an obnoxious character that's still palatable in a sitcom. You know, you can easily go over the top with this um, or try and not be so off-putting by holding back. But I think she does a really good job at 
you know, giving peaks and valleys of Sally Weaver. She's not at 100% the whole time, but she's just, yeah, I think she does incredibly well um, as this character. I think she's absolutely, I think she's absolutely perfect. Um, the writers of the episode, uh, Max Pross and Tom Gamble, they did the commentary. And so they have a lot to say about her. <laughs> and their experience uh, with her on set. So I'll get to that later when I cover the extras. Okay, next we're in Monks. Frank and George are at a booth, and <laughs> Frank says, as you know, we're not moving to Del Boca Vista, Florida. So this is kind of a carryover from the last episode, and George is, of course, still miserable about that. I am aware. So Frank asks George if it would be okay with him if he turned his old bedroom into a billiard parlor, you know, complete with all the authentic stuff, <laughs> regulation size table, everything. Elaine enters and George is excited to invite her to sit with him, um, uh, excuse me, with them. <laughs> I don't think he can really stand being, you know, alone with his, either of his parents for too long. She, of course, does not want to. And I, got, I actually have a, have a thing. Ah, the thing's canceled. Come on. So she sits. There's an awkward pause and Finally, she asks Frank, oh, did George show you that picture from Tuscany? And he doesn't know what she's talking about. And she says, oh, I saw a man in front of a sign that said Costanza, and I thought George would get a kick out of it. And Frank is very interested. You know, it could be his cousin Carlo. And then we find out from George that one of the Costanza brothers stayed back when the rest came to America. Elaine asks Frank, so you weren't born here? No. And that's why he could never become president, he says. It always irked him. That's why he doesn't vote. No interest in politics. <laughs> they don't want me. I don't want them. George is like, I don't know what you're getting so riled up for. There's probably a million Costanzas. Frank says, don't bring me down. Frank asks her if she has another copy of the photo, but she doesn't. She says, you know, but the maestro might. Who's that? Well, he's this guy I went to Tuscany with. He's a great guy, but I, I really wouldn't feel comfortable asking him. And George is curious, well, why not? Because he hasn't called me since we got back. She explains how she spilled some wine on an 8x10 photo of one of his favorite opera stars. George is like, oh, who? You know, the three tenors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pavarotti, Domingo, and uh, the other guy. She says, the other guy. My take on this scene, uh, what an absolute delight to have Elaine, George, and Frank in a scene together. Very rare combination, and I'm here for that. Elaine has that moment, I think, that we all have when <laughs> we've made eye contact with someone, not licking the corner of your mouth, but just someone who you know, but you really just don't want to talk to. And in this case, she sees Frank at the booth with George. And, you know, there's no way to get out of it. You, you've been caught. Um, you have to just go through with it. <laughs> I think we've all been a very relatable moment. I love the, I have to, um, I have to go to a, a thing. <laughs> She's like, I can't come up with anything better. I, why didn't she go with another women's rights conference? I don't know. JLD's performance here is great. I, I love the little physical moments of her wanting to get the hell out of there. She never fully gets comfortable in that booth. <laughs> she's constantly, she's like rubbing her face when Frank gets all riled up. She's kind of looking around at the end of the scene like, I come on, I, I can't, I can't sit here for too long. And we also get some information about what happened with the maestro. I mean, back in that other episode he was in where they get together, it, it happened pretty fast. And she joins him in Tuscany by the end of that episode. And that was 14 episodes ago, by the way. <laughs> I was kind of like, oh, when did that happen? Oh, a hell of a long time ago. And I do like the whole the other guy bit. I think that's very funny. They do not say the name of that tenor the entire episode, which they shouldn't. So I think that's a really good touch. Okay, next we are in an airplane. Jerry has that huge gift box uh, on his lap along with his bag, leaving no room for him to move, really. And the flight attendant tells him that, you know, if he has to be careful with that box, then the bag has to go in the overhead. So she takes it and she jams it and we hear some glass breaking <laughs> and Jerry's just wincing the whole time. The actress here who plays the flight attendant is Monica Allison. She's also appeared in Martin, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. She will also return to Seinfeld in the Puerto Rican Day episode in season nine. She's one of the women in the theater when uh, George <laughs> tries that line in blimp. That's got a heart. Um, she's fine in this episode. I think she nailed it being a flight attendant. Um, one thing I did want to mention, because it, it, it reminded me of this um, this thing that I think a lot of actors 
can relate to. Um, I always think whenever I see actors having to do a lot of action with props and stuff, um, I always think about how difficult that is. It's the, it could be the simplest thing, but it feels so unnatural when a camera is rolling. And so Monica Allison here, she has the task of putting his bag in the overhead and forcefully shutting the door. Again, it seems so simple, but when you're on a set and you have tons of people watching, I, I don't know if the live audience was there, but um, even if they weren't, there's a a whole lot of crew watching. Um, you know, you got the director just kind of laser focused on what you're doing. It can be really nerve wracking. You know, I've had experiences with this, especially when you do a lot of like these training videos, which is a lot of what the acting work here in Denver is, um, which I'm not complaining. I'm happy to get any job. But I've had to do a a lot of things where I'm placing papers somewhere, I'm holding up a phone because I'm showing an app, or in one shoot, I remember all I had to do was open the lid of a lunchbox. And I practiced it a couple of times because I just wanted to make sure, you know, the camera position was good for when I was going to open it, where my hands were. And when the director yelled action, it's like I couldn't even control my own hands. Like I knocked the lunchbox like askew, like I um my fingers slipped. At one point like I just kind of dropped the lid. Like it was like what the hell is happening? Literally all I have to do is just lift the lid of a lunchbox. It's just it's just amazing. So anyway, I wanted to call that out. Bravo to Monica Allison. She did this very naturally. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is unpacking and he sees barbecue sauce spilled all over his stuff. And he's like, oh, that flight attendant must have broke the bottle when she jammed the bag in the overhead because of this stupid gift. Kramer's there and he says, oh, don't worry, we can salvage the sauce. <laughs> Jerry's like, I don't care about that. It came in this funny bottle and the guy on the bottle looked like Charles Grodin. And the reason that's significant is because Jerry's going on the show and that was going to be his bit on the show. Kramer's like, well, just do your material. I'm out. <laughs> Kramer's like, well, you got to get to work. Yeah, thanks for the tip. George enters. And Jerry tells him about his gift from Sally Weaver. Yeah, Susan said you two really hit it off. No one hit anything off, Jerry said. She just gave me the gift. While George is opening it, Kramer is scraping the sauce from Jerry's clothes onto a plate and eating it with like white bread. <laughs> Jerry's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I, whenever I see this scene, I just think of like, like fibers of shirt mixed in with the sauce. Ugh, it just grosses me out. George is making a total mess opening his gift. <laughs> All the packing peanuts are going everywhere. So Kramer comes up with a bit for, for Jerry. Hey, why don't you do something about styrofoam? You know, what is all this stuff? Why do we need this stuff? And why do they make them so small? Jerry's like, where's the punchline? Oh, it's all attitude. I, this part always makes me laugh. I love Kramer's face, like when he says so small and he kind of like is nodding at Jerry, like, can you believe how amazing this is? George finds his crappy gift, which is a welcome mat personalized with the Costanzas on it. He says, oh, it's pretty cheap considering she's a big executive at Federal Express. Jerry is so livid. Is she out of her mind? Why didn't she just ship it? Kramer likes it, and George is like, no, no, it's terrible. I don't want it. Kramer's like, well, maybe your dad would want it. And George is like, yeah, I doubt it. Then he tells them about how Frank is putting a pool table in his old bedroom. Well, Kramer's ears perk up. Well, maybe I'll go over there and knock a few balls around with him. You know, show him a thing or two. <laughs> Next, we're at the Costanzas. Kramer and Frank are talking about what games of pool they like, and they decide to gamble a little bit, too, while they play. Then we see this montage of them trying to play in this small ass bedroom with this big ass table. <laughs> it just is not working very well. <laughs> so here's where my other Seinfeld IRL uh, <laughs> uh, moment, I guess, or, or plot point uh, really, really is relatable. Um, so this whole, you know, furniture too big for a room, it just kind of reminds me of my my house growing up. Um, I grew up in a pretty small ranch home. It wasn't big, you know, but it, it was perfectly, it was homey, it was cozy. I loved my house. But the, the thing about it, and unfortunately, Mama Desai and Papa Desai did not 
really believe in measuring when it came to getting furniture, um, <laughs> particularly our kitchen table. So for years, we just had this old wooden kitchen table that, you know, sat four because there was four of us in the family. It was perfectly fine. And then uh, in the heart of the 90s, in the heart of glass furniture, (laughs) when that was in fashion, um, my parents purchased this glass table. Now, it was huge. And then they decided to also purchase really big chairs to go around the table. Now, these were like chunky, like large cushiony chairs. Um, They were dining chairs, but they were still, you know, like the really padded ones. And we could barely maneuver around this table in our small kitchen. And then later on, so there, there was that. And then later on, my parents purchased a dining table in sort of our small dining area. So we had a, (laughs) we would eat in the kitchen like our normal meals. And then we also had a dining table for, you know, I guess more formal meals, which we never had. It just became kind of our storage area. And uh, same thing, Um, real big table for a real small space. So anyway, it's just kind of been, (laughs) it's kind of been uh, something that in my adult life, I'm just kind of, I'm so paranoid. I'm like, we got to measure it. Like we have to measure. I do not want to be like, you know, like kind of sneaking around, like having to kind of turn your body to just get around furniture. And like in my parents' room, which was again, not a big room. This house was built, I want to say in like the forties. So everything was small. Um, The rooms were small, the closets were small, but my parents in their, in their bedroom got a king sized bed and then also cream lacquer dressers. I mean, it was just like you could barely, I mean, knees were always bumped. Toes were always stubbed because you just were trying to like find a way around the furniture all the time. So anyway, um, lots of large furniture in very small spaces uh, in the Desai, in the Desai home <laughs> growing up. And so when I watched this episode and <laughs> Clearly, Frank did not take into account the size of the table versus the size of the room. So it just reminds me of this kind of annoying thing to me as I was growing up. But also now I look back and I kind of look back on that time with fondness. All right. Next, we are in George's apartment. George enters to find Susan moving in more of her stuff. And he's so annoyed. More stuff. He goes back into the bedroom where she's put up her doll collection and he's horrified. What is that? Susan comes in and asks what's going on. And he points out a doll that looks just like his mother. George, it's a doll. I know it's a doll, but she looks exactly like my mother. Oh, get out of here, Susan says. <laughs> I don't know what the hell Susan's looking at, but that <laughs> that doll is a, uh, an exact replica of Estelle. Next, we're at the Costanzas. Kramer and Frank are still playing. Estelle enters and says, you're still playing? You've been up here three hours. And we still haven't finished the first game. First game? We're still learning the subtleties of the table. (laughs) Frank tells her that Kramer knows the maestro so he could get that picture. Estelle does not believe that it's going to be his cousin. You don't know that, Frank yells. Estelle exits and Frank asks if, you know, they're going to go see the maestro. And Kramer says, yeah, as soon as the game is over. Oh, boy, Frank says. Kramer goes for a shot and shatters the window behind him with the pool cue. All right, next we're in George's bed. Susan is trying to get some sexy time going, but George sees the doll that looks just like his mother right next to her. Susan tells him, I used to love sleeping with my dolls when I was a little girl. And George is like, I can't do this. You know, he feels like he's in bed with his mother. And Susan's like, oh, stop it, and pulls him back to kiss her. As he's kissing her, he's pushing the doll out of sight under a pillow. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is telling Elaine about the Oradent, this new toothbrush, and he's just like, oh, you have to get it. You know, it feels like you went to the dentist with every use. And she says, oh, that's dynamite. He asks her if she wants to go to the Charles Grodin show. She wants to know who else is on the show. And he's like, oh, um, one of the three tenors. <gasps> Which one? Not Pavarotti, not Domingo. <gasps> the other guy? Yeah. Elaine is so excited. She can't believe it. Jerry's like, why? So she explains about the picture and the maestro. You think I could get his autograph? Yeah, why not? (gasps) Wow, 
the other guy. George enters looking awful. I'm on no sleep, bro. He explains to Jerry and Elaine about the doll and that Susan likes to sleep with it. Jerry puts it together and says, you in bed with your mother last night? Felt like it. He's like, this doll is pretty spooky. It's really freaking me out, man. Anyway, he's got to go to Queens to pick up that doormat. Susan wants it out for when Sally comes to town. Jerry's like, wait wait a second, she's coming to New York? Yeah, Susan said you'd be excited. Excited? I'm going to kill her. She knew she was coming here, and yet she still had me lug that huge box, (laughs) which caused that bottle to break that looked like Charles Grodin. George is like, well, call her and ask her to bring another one. Oh, I will. You know what? I'll have her bring a whole case of it. It'll be really heavy. Let's see how she likes sitting on a plane with a big box on her lap. Lane's like, oh, that sounds pretty juvenile. (laughs) And Jerry confirms that with saying, ooh, a dinosaur. (laughs) You got a little cereal toy. Uh, My take on this scene, the whole Oradent bit between Jerry and Elaine makes me laugh. I, I think Elaine is... I think she's truly not invested, but I think she also loves how much it will bother Jerry to be so passe about it. You know, he it's rare that Jerry gets so passionate about stuff. (laughs) I think he's so like blah about a lot of things. But, you know, she knows him well enough. That's like if she's not going to really get into it, it's going to really bother him. And it starts with this whole, oh, that's dynamite. (laughs) She's not even looking at him. And again, we see how uninterested Elaine is in Jerry's career here when she when she's invited to the Charles Grodin show. And her first question is to ask, well, who else is on the show? It's a it's another funny bit that really goes on for the whole run of the series. I just I love that their friendship involves really no support for his comedy career and vice versa. You know, he, he doesn't really respect anything she does. <laughs> Catalog writer's block. Um, so it goes both ways. Elaine's excitement to get back into the maestro's good graces. It just baffles me. I mean, clearly she thinks he's sponge worthy, but why? I I don't get it. I just don't get it. Okay, next we're in the maestro's dressing room. Frank is telling him about the possibility of that photo being his long lost cousin. The maestro says, well, unfortunately, those photos are at home. Kramer says, well, if you bring them by, maybe they can interest him in a game of pool. Frank here has his own billiard room. And apparently Frank and Kramer have come up with a name for the for the billiard room, <laughs> but it's it's not billiards. He's trying to think of it to tell the maestro, and Kramer just keeps saying billiard room. <laughs> no, 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 not bi- not billiards. It's uh, what is it? What uh, what is it? Uh, the place to be. The place to be. Yes. And the maestro says, "Then I shall be there." You know, if you'll excuse me, I must prepare for the symphony. And he gets up, and he has no pants on. And then he shares it's because of an old conductor's trick to keep the perfect crease in his pants. He doesn't sit before a performance. Oh, and Kramer and Frank are very impressed by that. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. George is showing the doll to Jerry, and (laughs) Jerry's clearly horrified, but he's like, eh, it's not exactly like her. He's like, come on, if my mother keeps shrinking, this is what she's going to look like in 10 years. Jerry's like, why don't you just get rid of it? Ah, He tried, he said, but Susan's so attached to it, the guilt got to him. So he exits and we hear a scream in the hallway and it's Elaine. (laughs) She's like, did you see that? I'm just glad it's out of here, Jerry says. She's got a poster with her. It's of the three tenors to get autographed. Sally buzzes and she's got a whole case of the barbecue sauce. Jerry asks Elaine if she got the Orident. And she's like, no, Jerry's so irritated. Why wouldn't you get something that's way better? And she just says, it doesn't matter to me. Sally enters, and we find out that she had an empty seat next to her, so bringing the case of barbecue sauce was no problem. Well, it turns out she brought the wrong sauce, and Jerry is so upset, he needed the one with the guy on the bottle. Sally says that in Memphis, they consider that sauce kind of a joke. I know it's a joke, Jerry says. That's the point. And now he has nothing when he goes on the Charles Grodin show. Sally's like, you could do your material. I don't have any material. Elaine says, he's got nothing. My take on this scene, uh, I love the scream from Elaine in the beginning. (laughs) Great scream acting by JLD. And we get more of her dismissing the Oradent. And we also see how much it annoys Jerry. Like we really get into it in this uh, this scene. I don't understand this attitude. I love the way he says that. And it's a good performance by Jerry as well. Like I feel like this is how he would be in real life. And JLD plays this so well from that first no, when he asks her if she got the brush, she's like, no, like, why would I? I just love how she delivers every response and how Jerry gets more and more bothered by it, (laughs) especially the 
doesn't matter to me. <laughs> uh, and, you know, in a future episode, we're going to learn about Elaine's oral hygiene routine. So it makes it even funnier. I mean, she seems like she would want a better brush based on how much time she spends in the bathroom before bed. But but also, if that means bringing Jerry any satisfaction, she's all set. It's OK. She'd rather annoy him. Uh, physicality wise, the swigs of water, <laughs> it's just, it's a little thing, you know, she's just drinking water, she's talking to him, but it just, it seems that much more dismissive, which, you know, it just adds to it. And Kathy Griffin, I have to say, every line read of hers makes me laugh. <laughs> the kind of joke. <laughs> she's so funny. All right, next we're in Monks. George is eating lunch and uh, the Estelle doll is propped up in the chair right across from him for some reason. All he can hear is Estelle's voice berating him from how he's eating to how old his shirt is. Why don't you buy a new shirt? He's talking back to the doll and people are starting to look at him. Finally, he gets up telling the doll, let's go, let's go. Then he sees Dina, his old high school friend from an earlier episode, (laughs) the episode where Dina thinks he's mentally unstable. And uh, so, yeah, so next time she sees him, he is talking to a doll And uh, as he exits, she tells Ruthie Cohen, you know, that man really belongs in a sanitarium. All right, next we're at the Costanza's house. Kramer, Frank, and the maestro all have their pants off, and Kramer absolutely loves it. He's like, I'm playing pool, but my pants remain perfectly creased. (laughs) Frank finds the photo and is convinced it's his cousin Carlo. The maestro's like, yes, I recognize him. He's known as sort of a village idiot. Kramer's like, come on, come on, let's finish the game. A concerto starts, and um, the maestro loves it, and he starts conducting. Frank is frustrated with his playing, and Kramer's like, oh, you need to follow through. He gets behind Frank to show him, and they're sort of bent over together while the maestro is conducting in the corner. (laughs) And Estelle walks in on this scene with snacks, and she's just, the visual is too much for her. Oh, my God. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is still bitching about the whole bottle fiasco and that he has nothing to talk about on the Charles Grodin show. Elaine asks if he's ever considered writing new material. Well, maybe if there weren't so many people in my apartment, I'd be able to get some work done. Me? You talking about me? No, you're never here. She says, oh, God, that doll was really freaky, wasn't it? And Jerry gets an idea. Oh, maybe I'll talk about the doll. I'll bring the doll. I'll bring a picture of George's mother. It's pretty funny. I'm going to call George. Uh, my take on this scene, <laughs> I, not much to it, obviously, but I love that Elaine says the line. I think we're all thinking she asks the question, hey, write some new damn material, Jerry. Gosh. <laughs> all right. Next, we're in George's apartment. Sally answers the phone and Jerry thinks it's Susan. She says, hi, Jerry, it's Sally. Oh, <laughs> is his reaction. <laughs> he gives her the message to tell George to meet him at the TV studio with a picture of his mother and the doll that looks like her. <gasps> Is this for your comedy routine? Yeah. Don't worry, I'm on the case. All right, back at the Costanzas, the maestro, he needs some air (laughs) and he exits. He's probably like, why am I playing pool in this small room? Kramer tries another shot with the pool cue and he hits the wall violently and he's like, you know, this is no good. Then he sees the maestro's conducting baton and he uses it as a cue and it works very well. This table's mine, he says, and he hits a bunch of spot on shots. All right, next we're in the dressing room of the Charles Grodin show. Elaine arrives and Jerry points at the other guy who's sitting there getting his makeup done. And she's so excited. She goes over to him and she's like, it's you. It's it's really you. I'm I'm such a huge fan of yours. And she asks him if he wouldn't mind signing the poster. He says, my pleasure. He signs it and uh, she tries to thank him <laughs> as he's getting up to exit. Thank you so much, Mr. Camaro, Mr. Cassine. Well, whatever. (laughs) Elaine says she's going to take it to the maestro and that he has a show at the Queen's Convalescent Center. Oh, that's a hell of a gig, Jerry says. (laughs) Jerry then gives her the Orident, which comes in this huge box that she will have to carry. And he really pulls a Sally Weaver here. And she's like, how the hell am I going to carry this thing? And Jerry takes his pants off and Elaine's like, what are you doing? He tells her it's a trick he learned from Kramer. Keeps the crease. So he sits down in his boxers and salutes her goodbye. And <laughs> she kind of does this slow exit against the door jam, <laughs> looking at him like, you're a weirdo. Uh, my take on this scene, when Elaine tries to say 
his name of the other guy. I lose it every time. That is the perfect way she delivers that line. Then Mr. Camaro, oh, that look on her face. It's too good. It's just, it's awesome. Now here I think uh, we see the rebuffing of the Orodent really backfire for Elaine because Jerry takes it upon himself to get her the Orodent in this huge box. <laughs> um and her walk out the door is hilarious. I always love that exit where like the little like kind of where she's just inching across <laughs> across the door. What a fun choice. All right. Next, we are at the Costanzas. The maestro is on his way out and he tells Estelle that she's been a very gracious hostess and he kisses her hand and exits. She is so charmed. Oh, thank you, maestro. Then Frank shoves the picture in her face. Yeah, what is it? I found him, he says. <sighs> Of course, she doesn't believe him. You've been cooped up in this room too long. You never support me. Let's see what George says about this. Where are my pants? <laughs> Frank grabs his pants and exits. Kramer takes his pants. And he's so happy. Oh, beautiful. All right, next, we're back in the dressing room. Sally enters. Hey, Mr. Harry Legs. Jerry wonders where George is. She's like, don't worry, I have your doll. And she pulls out a totally different one. No, that's the wrong doll. She says she saw the doll he was talking about. Not funny. This one's much funnier. Jerry's like, this is a nightmare and walks away. Sally puts the doll down and says, I'll be watching. Don't screw up. The other guy who is eating spaghetti accidentally wipes his mouth on Jerry's pants that are draped over his chair. <laughs> Jerry sees this. My pants. Just at that moment, the stage manager comes in. Mr. Seinfeld, you're on. All right, next, we're seeing Elaine's trip to the Queen's Convalescent Center. She's trying to negotiate the box and the poster. She wants to desperately protect the poster for the maestro. And we see her almost get run into a guy with two huge ice cream cones. And then on the subway, she saves the poster from getting coffee spilled on it. Finally, she arrives at the maestro's gig, and he's really surprised to see her. She's like, I, I know you're very busy, but I, I wanted to bring you this. And he thinks she's talking about the Orident, because <laughs> that's the bigger item in her in her hands. And she's like, no, 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 not, not the toothbrush, the, the poster. So he dramatically takes off the rubber band, and he's so touched by it. Oh, an autographed poster by my favorite tenor and those two other guys. She says how she felt so bad about what happened in Tuscany. He says, this is magnifico. He gets called to the stage, and he tells Elaine to wait for him until after the show. We'll celebrate. Oh, this is all she's wanted. She's like, oh, okay. She picks up the huge Orident box and knocks over another bottle of wine that just happens to be there, and it spills all over the poster. Then we cut to the stage. The maestro's baton is all bent because Kramer <laughs> was playing pool with it. So he cannot conduct it all, and the show is ruined. My take on this scene, I think this is done really well. Uh, seeing her journey, trying to keep the poster spotless while holding onto the huge box. It's awkward, but I, I, I like that we see that. We we kind of, you know, the stakes are her making sure she gets this poster delivered to the maestro. Totally perfect. All right. So when the maestro opens the poster, <laughs> we can clearly see the names of the three tenors at the top. So instead of Camaro or Casir, whatever she says, she could have just read Carreras at the top. It's Jose Carreras. Um, I don't know. You just would think someone on the show, the art director, whoever, would have chosen another poster or at the very least just cut that part off. Because as an audience, we can see <laughs> that the names are on there. But I guess in a way, it makes it way funnier. It's like Elaine, the, the name's right there. Uh, we needed closure to the plot, so her spilling the wine is necessary, I guess, but a bit hacky. And stupid Jerry with that huge box, which, why does he bring it to the Charles Grodin show and give it to her there? Which, I mean, so like he had to lug another huge box to uh, another location when she's at his apartment all the time, which he points out earlier. <laughs> and then also, why didn't she just refuse it? I mean, I know why, because then the plot wouldn't work and we wouldn't be able to get closure and all this other stuff happening with the maestro. But I just don't think it tracks very well for either of these characters. Jerry would not lug that thing to the Charles Grodin show. And Elaine would have just denied the origin. I mean, the entire episode, she's been like so uninterested in it. So why does she give in now when he gives it to her in the dressing room? You know, I just love asking these absolutely useless questions that have no reason to be answered.
All right, next we are in George's apartment. Susan is really upset that George took her doll out of the house. And he's like, I just wanted a second opinion. Frank arrives and asks George if he thinks the man in the picture could be his flesh and blood. Of course, your mother. And then he looks over and sees the doll in Susan's hands. And he hears Estelle's voice. Oh, stop bothering everyone with that picture. It's ridiculous. Frank yells back at the doll. I'll show you ridiculous. He grabs the doll from Susan and pulls the head off. Now what do you have to say for yourself? And George says to Susan, I told you it looked like her. There's a tag to the episode. Frank arrives in Tuscany at the Costanza shop. He tries to hug the guy and says, I'm your cousin. Aren't you Carlo? No, the guy says. Mi nome is Giuseppe. All right. <laughs> Frank's like, I guess it's not him and exits. All right. I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. You've heard of the three tenors, Jose Carreras and those two other guys. But have you also heard of the saying, three's a crowd? Sure, their trio of voices were powerful, and those harmonies would send tingles through your body. But sometimes your ears need a break, a sort of audio palate cleanse, if you will. Introducing the one baritone. Finally, the lowest vocal range of all the vocal types shines in all its glory. The one baritone may not make your body tingle, but you will feel it, mostly in your butt. Studies have actually shown that low tones can clear symptoms including respiratory impairment and oral pain. Order the debut album, The One Baritone, How Low Can I Go, by calling 555-FU-3 Tenors. For a limited time, you will receive a complimentary bottle of Dramamine, because while low tones can improve some symptoms, it will most likely make you nauseous and dizzy, which is why our lawyers told us not to play any snippets of the record on this advertisement. The One Baritone. Don't worry about his name. And we're back. Okay, as I said before, the commentary was done by Pross and Gamble, the two writers. Okay, so what they, uh, the tea that they spilled about Kathy Griffin, um, <laughs> they said, you know, she wasn't really well known at the time, um, but she just nailed the audition, especially that line. They said that wacko. <laughs> she really just, just blew them away. But they did add that while she was on set, she was kind of like this wound up energizer bunny, like getting into everyone's faces, kind of annoying everyone. She just, she was clearly excited to be there, but she just had no boundaries. I guess she would always be in Jerry's face. Like at any rate, she was annoying a lot of the people on set. Um, and then she proceeded to put that experience about how Jerry was really rude to her on set in her standup, which I actually, I do remember seeing this. So she was talking about how she was. She was so excited. She was a huge admirer of Jerry Seinfeld. It was like the number one show in the country. So it was like a big break for her, obviously. And so she wasn't going to waste her chance. And she's like, I don't know if I'm ever going to meet Jerry Seinfeld again. So um, I think she was something where she was going to go to a friend's birthday party or something, some kind of an event. And so she really wanted Jerry to sign something for this friend. And she all day was just trying to get this autograph. And he was just crabby, <laughs> you know. So she does the whole thing in her stand-up. And that's the reason she reprised her role. Jerry saw that and he actually really got a kick out of it. And he thought it was really funny. And so that's how she comes back, you know, as Sally, but now Sally the the artist. And um that whole one woman show, Jerry Seinfeld is the devil. So look, <laughs> I think the lesson there is sometimes being annoying and obnoxious could actually help you. She ended up back on the show with an entire plot written around her and she got to be like one on one with Jerry. I think that's I just think that's such a cool and inspiring story. Uh, they also talked about how the episode had to be heavily rewritten after the table read. So originally they had something totally different for Elaine. And so the original storyline for Elaine was that she was to have her portrait done by a pastel artist who she thinks is doing it to flirt with her. But then he, in fact, is just trying to make money off of her. He's like trying to sell her the painting after he he 
paints it. Um, So then Frank ends up with the painting and putting it up in the billiard room. So while the maestro's there, he ends up kind of backing into it, because again, the table's too big and the room is too small, and gets an imprint of Elaine's face on his ass. Yeah, um, so apparently this was much too complicated. It bombed at the table read. So then the autograph storyline came about uh, after the read-through. Larry David in particular, they said, was was just so bothered by that storyline. He's like, he's like, the thought of an imprinted face on an ass just could never happen. <laughs> I just, lo- I would have, I would have loved to hear that conversation. And no one gets an imprint on their ass. Like I just, I just, the Larry David way of complaining about this storyline could have been an episode in itself. And they also said they, they're pretty sure that the Elaine storyline was written the day before they filmed it, which I'm like, mm, I'll get into it a little later, but I, I think that's pretty obvious. They also added that this whole thing of Jerry not having new material is so far from the truth. You know, they kind of paint Jerry in this episode as being a lazy comedian, but in real life, he is a workhorse. And so they just were kind of amused by that when they were watching the episode. They're like, it's so it's a funny bit, but they're just like, it just couldn't be further from the truth. Um, in the IMDb trivia, I thought this was this was interesting. The Costanza sign in Tuscany reads Costanza Import Export. <laughs> They're just so obsessed with importing exporting on this show. <laughs> All right, now it's time to open Greg's sack lunch. Greg is our most dedicated contributor, and every week he sends in a sack full of his thoughts. First, I find in Greg's sack his overall thoughts. He says, this used to be one of my favorite episodes of this season, but upon rewatching it, it's just sort of middle of the road. I like how the plots sort of weave together and we get a good dose of the Costanzas, but that said, I don't love what they give Elaine in this one. And I'll get more into that in my scene swap. The doll and George story is what makes this tolerable. Agreed. And uh, like I said, little hint there, you know, there, the story for Elaine had to be rewritten very quickly, most likely the day before they filmed. So uh, yeah, it, it was a rush job and it kind of shows. Next in Greg Sack are his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says, I love the first Elaine scene where she comes to the coffee shop and sees George is there with Frank and reluctantly stays after George totally calls her bluff with the things canceled. I like how she actually tried to engage with Frank with her Tuscany story about seeing another Costanza. Yeah, that first scene is great. I just, just, you feel it from her head to her toes. Like Elaine's like, oh God, why did I have to walk in right now? Greg goes on to say, though it mostly doesn't involve Elaine, I love the doll that looks like Estelle. I mean, it looks exactly like Estelle. (laughs) We do get a phenomenal off-screen Elaine scream, (laughs) that's hard to say, off screen Elaine scream when she sees it. But the brilliance is how George can hear it yelling at him. The best scene of the episode is George in the diner with the doll yelling at him. When Estelle says, you're wearing that shirt? You've had it for five years already. Why don't you buy a new shirt? As you can tell, I love that too, Greg. (laughs) He says, this is in my top bits of dialogue in the entire series of the show. It never fails to crack me up. Uh, Yeah, 100%. I love love it too. (laughs) Like, of course, Estelle is going to get so mad about a shirt. It seems like her and Susan would be on the same page. You're wearing that shirt? Next, Greg says, one Elaine bit I do find funny is when she's on the subway trying to keep the poster from being damaged and she takes a full drink to the face. Stupid physical comedy, but she delivers. Oh, yeah. I mean, we already know Julia Louis-Dreyfus does not shy away from any physical comedy and she's she's just a master at it. I love that part, too. All right. Next uh, in Greg's sack is his scene swap idea. Kramer's stories are usually what I would cut and here it's no different. But because Kramer is paired up with Frank playing pool in the too small of a room to do it in, I enjoy it for what it is. I would also give Elaine something more instead of the stupid toothbrush thing that isn't remotely funny. They use it as a reason for her poster to get ruined, but it's just not funny. And like before, I don't care for the maestro character. So I would rather just give Elaine more with the Costanzas or even tie her into Sally Weaver and Jerry. Yeah, exactly. Um, everything feels rushed with it. It's it's a stretch. Um, like I said before, too, I'm like, why is she so into this stupid maestro <laughs> who gets upset about his little precious picture? I mean, I, OK, if it's an autographed picture of your favorite tenor, I get it. But um, yeah, 
I, he's given enough red flags here, Elaine. <laughs> why, why is he sponge worthy to you? I don't get it. Uh, I agree, though. Like, I think Kathy Griffin and JLD would, would really work well together. Uh, the, the toothbrush thing, like, I mean, like I said before, I do enjoy it because of the vibe it creates. And I'll get more into that with my final notes. And finally, Greg's extra thoughts. He says, I'm not a Kathy Griffin fan per se, nothing against her politics or anything. I've just never found her all that funny. However, I do like her as Sally Weaver, especially in the upcoming episode where she's a comic who just trashes Jerry. Her character is totally annoying, but it works well off of someone like Jerry, who is so easily annoyed. Exactly. That's the thing. I mean, love her or hate her. I, you have to give it up. I mean, she is the perfect Sally Weaver. I've seen so many, like, I just on Facebook, because, you know, Big Brother's always listening, um, Big Brother being Apple, I, I always see these, like, Seinfeld pages and, like, worst character ever, Sally Weaver, blah, blah, blah. Now, they are clearly people who do not agree with Kathy Griffin's politics. You know, they kind of bash her more for that than her actual acting. And I do have to say, though, like I <laughs> she's one of those artists who I I enjoy her um, for the most part. I, you know, I will say some of the things she's done in the last few years are, are just I just think bad judgment. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole Trump severed head thing, but um, it's more just about like she clearly needs a lot of attention and wants a lot of sympathy. And look, she's gone through cancer. There's been a, there's been a lot going on in Kathy Griffin's life. I, I follow her on Instagram, you know, some that I think she brings on herself, but then also other things that I think are absolutely unfair. And of course, something like cancer, it's no one's fault. But at any rate, um, a lot of the hate for her especially as of late, is just people people don't like her politics. But uh, Greg, I, I love that you're like, hey, I'm not a really big fan, but you can't deny, like, she is such a great character. She's she's really funny. She's really talented. I mean, th- her portrayal of many characters, I used to watch Suddenly Susan as well, and um, she's just great. Like, she has so much energy. She's really witty. She delivers lines so, like, in, in ways no one else could. I mean, she's just, she's got that talent. Um so I just like to recognize that about Kathy Griffin. Uh, but yeah, to your point, Greg, I mean, <laughs> the, the character is annoying. I think Kathy Griffin, you know, self-admittedly is annoying and obnoxious. So just perfect for the role. Next, Greg says, I'm bothered by the running gag that nobody knows the name of the third tenor. If you had purchased a poster and came to meet the man, would you not learn his name? That just sort of annoys me as it's not really funny to begin with. Okay, well, I guess this is our first disagreement in a while, Greg. Um, (laughs) I think our biggest disagreement is by far the fact that you don't like Jay Peterman. I still don't, I just don't get it, Greg, and it makes me angry. Um, No, but uh, (laughs) I think it is funny. I think it's like, I think it was pretty relatable if you can talk about opera stars, fame being a relatable pop culture thing. But anyway, um, I don't think anyone did know this guy's name. <laughs> I think, like I said earlier, I think the weirder thing is that the name is on the poster clearly and we see it, you know, the audience sees it and yet Elaine doesn't somehow on this poster. Now, you, you were bothered by the fact that she she bought the poster and knew she was going to meet him and didn't bother to learn it. I actually think that's that's actually funny. <laughs> like Just in all of this excitement to get the maestro's approval back, she doesn't bother to, uh, and the fact that, hey, it's his favorite tenor. <laughs> She's just like, I'm not learning his name. I'm, I'm just going to do all this stuff, go to all this trouble to uh, get this poster to him. And finally, Greg says, did you notice the B-roll of the airport right before Jerry's scene on the plane showed Trump Airlines? I didn't even know that was a thing. Seeing how it no longer exists, I'll chalk it up to yet another failed business by that guy. Uh, Well, yeah, you would be right. It's another failed business. But no, they actually did point that out in the notes about nothing, how it was Trump Airlines, which I believe operated from like, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's a short amount of time. And I think it went under in like 92. So it's not even accurate for 1996, which is when this episode aired. But at any rate, um, I feel like they've, I feel like we've seen it a few times in the B-roll um, Trump Airlines, which, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it was more prevalent in New York. I, I certainly don't remember seeing that at like the Detroit airport. Um, but at any rate, I don't want to talk about Donald Trump anymore. 
Thank you so much, Greg. We love your comments and your thoughts every week. Thank you so much for sending them in. And now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. Of course, it has to be her fucking up the guy's, the other guy's name, um, her facial expressions, and then doubling down with a second attempt after Camaro with Cassine. I don't even know what she says, but it's so great. Just perfect. A close second for me would be <laughs> sipping on that water bottle, totally dismissing the Oradent to Jerry, getting under his skin with that. I just think that's really entertaining. All right. And my final notes for the episode. I, uh, you know, I think we can definitely feel the rushed quality of Elaine's storyline here, as I mentioned in the commentary. I, you know, I don't hate the plot. I don't think it's as unfunny as Greg does, but it's certainly the weakest of the episode. I mean, (laughs) we're very, very weak. The other plots are so strong. I do love Jerry getting annoyed by Sally Weaver. She's such a great foil to him. Uh, The billiard room is hilarious. The doll is amazing. I mean, maybe we could have swapped out the maestro and Elaine thing altogether and just had Elaine help Jerry write new material. Like I kind of want, like that's maybe going out on a limb. And maybe that would have just been an expansion where she's like, writing new material, Jerry, ever heard of it? You know, and then maybe that could have been like, it's not as easy as you think. And they could have maybe gotten a little competitive with their with their writing careers. You know, he has to write stand up. She has to write catalog blurbs. So um, that could have been a really funny plot between the two of them. But they went this way. <laughs> At any rate, I think it is still better than an a print of Elaine's face on the maestro's ass. <laughs> but look at how hard I'm laughing. I just I that would be actually really really funny. But to Larry David's point, that does not happen. How would that happen? Why was it still wet when it's hanging up? Like there there's so many things to think about. So I think they made the right call. Overall, I really do like this episode, mostly because of the whole billiard room and the and the doll. JLD does a great job with such a weak plot. Her performance definitely brings it to life as much as possible. But, you know, a weak plot is a weak plot. And I think that's all I can say about the doll. Thank you so much for listening. Also, if you could rate and review the podcast, a five-star review, I would so appreciate it. Please, please do that. It really does help. And if you want to follow the podcast on social media... On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok, at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you want to go old school with email, please email me at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time. 